10 key principles for fulfilling a vision. The poorest man in the world is a man without a dream. As long as you have dreams, you are full of hope. A person of hope is a person who is still alive. So the poorest man in the world is really one without a dream. However, the most frustrated human on this planet is the one who has a dream that does not become a reality. It's really depressing and frustrating to, to have an idea that you had for years and you still can't see it come to pass. That hurts all of us. Most men dream. And when I say men, I'm using a generic term for both male and female. All human beings dream, but only the few who wake up and get out of bed and work diligently are the ones who experience the fulfillment of their dreams. I've discovered that one person with vision and passion is greater than the passive force of 99 interested people. And that's what's wrong with the world. Most people only have an interest in their destiny, but have no passion and drive to fulfill it. And this is what separates the people that make an impact in the world and those who just exist on the planet. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10, put that in your note please. It says this, whatsoever your hands find to do, do it with all your passion, with all your might, with all your ability. Whatever your hands find to do, whatever you set your hands to do, you must do it with all your passion, with all your might, or it will not happen. Now I believe that that scripture expresses a principle that most people miss, and that is you only accomplish what you fight for. If you are only interested in your dream, it will never come to pass. But if you are willing to put all your might and your strength and your energy into your dream, then nobody can stop it from coming to pass. Now I believe that scripture also implies that if you put your hands to do something, there will be resistance, there will be opposition, there will be pressure, there will be difficulties, so you have to apply pressure for success. You have to put your whole might behind your dream. Destiny demands diligence. Say it with me. Destiny demands diligence. One more time. Destiny demands diligence. If you believe that what it takes to be successful is going to be hard work and might, then it's going to take internal motivation to manifest an external dream. And it has to be something that's evidenced by your own life. I am that every human being that is on this earth, God placed in each one of us a vision and a call that is designed to give purpose and meaning to our lives. Everybody in this room was born with a dream that God put in them. No man gives you dreams. God does. And each human being has them. Yet there are too many people who make cemeteries of their lives. They bury their dream in their own life. They make themselves a graveyard of God's precious treasure. But I want to say that there is not enough darkness in the world to put out the light God has put in you. Can I hear an amen? I tell you there's so much stuff in you that if you are willing to capture it, nothing can stop it. The light that God put in you is so strong and so bright that all the darkness in the planet, all the darkness of people's opinions and all the darkness of your past failures can never put out the light of God's vision in your heart. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I would like for you to turn there with me. We'll come back to Nehemiah in a moment. But I want you to read a passage with me that is one of the keys to my future and my success and it can become yours too. God has put a vision in your heart and soul that is a piece of eternity 
that he gave you to deliver in time. In other words, God has put a little piece of what he wants done in your heart. The only problem is what God put in your heart is what's in his heart. And God lives in eternity. So God has actually done something awesome. God has placed in you a little piece of eternity that he wants you to deliver in time. So God put you in time so time could see a little piece of eternity that's in God. The Bible calls this the deep calling unto deep. There's something in you that is being called by eternity. And God is actually calling you to do something that he already has in his heart for you to do. Look at, if you will, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. We know this is very common. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Now look at verse 10. I have seen the burden that God has placed upon all men. That means every human being comes to earth with a weight. Can you take your notes and write these words? Responsible urge. God has placed within you a responsible urge. God has placed upon each human being. Whether you are 16 or 61, there is something in you that is a burden. God calls it a burden here, but the word in the Hebrew actually could be translated, he has placed upon you a heavy responsibility, a cry in your heart. What is that cry? That is the cry of purpose. It's the cry which says, I was born to do something. I don't know what it is yet, but I just feel that there's something I'm supposed to do. How many of you feel it? Do you feel that you were born to do something with your life? Everybody feels it. Even if they don't say it, they feel it. Well, that burden comes from God. And that burden is what? It's found in the next line. Verse 11. He makes everything beautiful in its time. Now, that means God has put in you something for you to do. He also placed a time for you to do it within. Therefore, in verse 1, it says, to every purpose there is a time to do it. Which means whatever you were born to do, God has attached a time and a season to get it done. Now, time is the duration of your life. Season is the phases of your life. Everything in the world has four seasons. And those seasons must come to pass. And there comes a season when you're supposed to do it. The first season is dependency. Where you depend totally on outside and eternal help. God does that with all of us. You were born attached to your mother. The fruit was actually born attached to the tree. And everything is born in the first season. You need help. You need God. You need people. You need to be taught. You need to be trained. That's the first season. The second season is the season of independence, where you capture what you were born to do. You don't depend on people anymore to, 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 to give you a dream or to help you. Now what you depend people on for now is to feed you so that you can live your dream. You become independent. You focus in on your own goals in life. Then the third phase is interdependence. Interdependence is where you are so free now, you can give your dream to other people. You can now pass on your vision to the next generation. And the final season is the season of death, where you literally become the fertilizer for other people's dreams in the next generation. If people don't live because of your death, then you really didn't live effectively. People should be able to feast from what you left us on this planet. That's the final phase. You know, one of the saddest things in the world is a tombstone. Because tombstones remind us that people used to live here. And if it wasn't for a tombstone, many folks wouldn't know you were even here. What a tragedy. You should live so effectively that there wouldn't be any need for them to put a tombstone to mark your grave because your life would be in the hearts and memories of people who could never forget what you did. Do you understand? That's why great people really don't need monuments, because you can't forget them. So if we even lost the grave of David or Joshua, it doesn't matter. They live so well that you can't ignore them. If you live properly, history will not be able to ignore that you lived. And that's the way you were born to live. You were born to make a mark in life that leaves fertilizer for the seed of the next generation to take root. 
Look at this last line, please. In verse 11, he has also set eternity in the hearts of every man. Wow. Yet they cannot fathom or understand what God has done from beginning to end. Please underline that verse. It's a powerful verse. It says not only did God give you a purpose, but the purpose is a piece of eternity God put in your heart. And the piece of eternity is what makes you uncomfortable. Do you know what it is to live in time attached to eternity? Do you know what it is to be waking up every day hearing a call that is outside of this world? Do you know what it is to hear in your heart a scream that is waiting for a response from the unseen? That means God has put in your heart something that calls the unseen into the scene. That's what's in your heart making you cry. That's this deep calling unto deep. And everybody has it. A piece of eternity. And that is why we must pursue and accomplish the dream God put in each of our hearts. Now, the vision that is in your heart is the spark that makes life work. Without this vision, this, this piece of eternity in each heart, we are merely existing. You know, it would be so depressing if all you had to look forward to after working for humans for 60 years is a gold watch and a pen. And most people are living that way. All they give you is your pension and a pen. Life is worth much more than a pension and a pen. Can I hear an amen? Wouldn't it be terrible if all they gave you was a pension after you made them millionaires? I believe God has a dream and a vision for your life that's supposed to carry you right out into eternity because that's what's pulling it. And that when you die, you're supposed to leave this earth not on pension, but on purpose. That it should not be I'm tired, but it should be I'm finished. Most people actually leave the earth tired, not completed. And we need to make sure that we can say at the end of our lives, it is finished not I am retired God has given us a dream that is bigger than retirement that's why retirement is not in scripture now my question that I want to answer for you today is what is the key to capturing and the fulfilling of the vision that is in your heart what is the key to the principles that make it happen now your dream may be for you to go to college and to develop uh, a business or to start a school. That dream, if it's from God, will frustrate you. Because everything you do except the dream will cause you to be un unhappy. The Bible says many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And that statement actually means that the only thing that will frustrate you is God's dream. Whatever you do, until you do God's dream, what you did will be unfulfilling. It will cause you to have depression. Now, I know this is a very amazing thought, but God's vision will depress you until you do it. No matter what you do, if it's not what God wants you to do, what God wants you to do will make what you did unsuccessful. That's why people who build big projects and accomplish fame and accomplish notoriety are still depressed inside because you can do everything, but if you didn't do what God told you to do, what God told you to do is going to depress what you did. Anybody here? That's the critical nature of God's purpose. No wonder why God says, many are the plans in your heart. I don't care what you do, he says. My purpose will prevail over, frustrate, and depress your plans. Therefore, success is never tied to what you do. It's tied to what God told you to do. That's why going to work on a job can really be depressing. Because if you're doing what you were not you were born to do, then you literally become angry at what you're doing. Monday mornings are depressing for most people because they go into a place they hate. Now can I suggest to you, however, that God gives you jobs to prepare you for your work. Your work is your purpose. Your job is your preoccupation on your way to your occupation. So what you need to do is stay on your job, but don't make it your permanent residence. That's why if people treat you bad on your job, don't worry about it, ignore them. Learn what you're supposed to learn. Commit yourself to your job. Get all the knowledge you can. Why? You're going to move on in a little while. Why? If you know your purpose, then every, every occupation is just a pre-occupation. It's your before occupation before you are occupied with what you were born to do. That's why I'm so glad for all the jobs I held because they all prepared me for this, what I'm doing right now. And this feels so good, I can do it for the rest of my life. 
So don't be frustrated with your job if you know your purpose. Purpose makes your job have meaning. That's why when they cut your pay, you don't worry about it because they're not the source. You're on your way to your purpose. Your purpose has your prosperity in it. Can I hear an amen from somebody? Once you find what you were born to do, you don't have to worry about where you are. Because where you are is only temporary. That's why being in a pit didn't disturb Joseph. Being in prison didn't make Joseph frustrated because he knew he saw himself sitting on a throne feeding the people. And if the pit ain't the throne, then just wait till they come to pick you up. Can I hear an amen from somewhere? God's purpose in your heart is what keeps you moving. Now, how do you make this dream come to pass when things don't go right? Now, I want you to write down every principle that I give you today because these will keep you for the rest of your life. If you are a businessman, businesswoman, a student, or you are a housewife, or if you are just a simple person who wants to do something big with your life, this is the way you do it. Ten principles that are, that are definitely going to have to be a part of your life if you're going to be successful. You cannot avoid them, you cannot ignore them. If you, if you don't do them or experience them, you'll never be successful. First, let me say that success is a result of understanding, obedience and submission and adherence to principle. If you understand the principles, you'll be successful. Any successful person is usually a person who understood principles, adhered to them, submitted to them, obeyed them, and they carried that person to success. Success is actually a guarantee. Everybody in the world could be successful. The only problem is only a few people obey the principles that make success. Everybody talks about it, they brag about it, but they don't allow the principles to work in their lives. And I know what I'm talking about because I have seen in my own life bringing something from zero, just an idea, to a reality where you're sitting today. And the principles I'm going to teach you today are not personal nor private. They are public and they are historical, they are set, and everybody who succeeds had to go through them. I'm talking about everybody. I'm talking about Jesus himself had to go through each one of these principles to be successful in his work of redemption. Moses went through the same ten principles. Jacob, same ten, ten principles. Joshua, same ten principles. David, same ten principles. And everyone Daniel, Shadrach, Nehemiah, everybody went through the same 10 principles, including Paul and Peter and Joseph. And if you don't go through them, I guarantee you failure. So if you want to be successful, I want you to remember these 10 principles. And believe me, principles are established laws that are designed to protect and preserve and to guarantee fulfillment of a dream. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, God speaking to his people, he says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you. And plans for your good and to give you an expected end. God says he has some plans for you, for all of us. And he wants those plans to be fulfilled, but we must follow his direction. In the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8, God establishes the key to fulfilling those plans. He said, Joshua, you're a young man, you got a big vision. It's your time now to fulfill your purpose. Moses is now dead. Let's see what you're going to do. And God's first advice to Joshua was this. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. He says, Obey the words that I've laid down for you. Do not turn from them to the right nor to the left, but walk in them day and night. Meditate upon them all day. In other words, he was telling Joshua, Learn the precepts and the principles of God, and you shall have good success. Now notice God's guarantee. Good success if you obey these commands that Moses himself had to obey. He didn't say to literally follow Moses' life, but follow Moses' principles. The ones that Moses used to, to become successful in his work. Moses used the same principles and Joshua used them and he was successful. Let's learn what they are. Number one, please turn to the book of Nehemiah. We're going to use Nehemiah as an example for these ten principles. Number one, you must have a clear guiding vision. You personally, as an individual, must have your own personal clear guiding vision. If you have no vision, forget success. Now where does vision come from? Vision comes from purpose. So you might want to put right in brackets next to number one, a clear purpose. Purpose is understanding why you exist. I was in college 
I got four bachelor's, uh, three bachelor's degrees and one master's degree. And one of my degrees uh, was in education, still is. And I remember taking a course in biology in university. I sat in this course for one year. It was a good course. They taught us some heavy stuff about the body. And they studied the neurological system of the body. They studied the, the blood systems of the body. They studied the bone structure. They studied all the intricacies of how the body works. They studied the brain cells. And we learned all this stuff. And at the end of it, I got an A in that particular class. I was so proud of myself. And while I was standing, looking at my grades, boasting to myself, I did a good job, I had learned everything about the human body, a question burst in my mind. And the question was, now that you know what the human body is, do you know why it is? You know, education can give you knowledge, but can't give you wisdom. Doctors know the human body, but may not know why it exists. God created the human body as his temple to fulfill a purpose. And I discovered then that the key to life is not knowing what you are, but knowing why you are. It's more important to know why you was born than to know the fact that you were born. Because being born without knowledge of why you were born makes life dangerous because you begin to experiment with your life. Purpose then is the first principle of success. Knowing why you were born. Knowing why you were born doesn't mean that you are isolated by yourself. It's like a car engine, isn't it? A battery has a purpose and a carburetor has a purpose and the spark plug has a purpose and each one is separate and unique and whole and yet they all need to come together in one engine to perform a purpose of mobilization. That is true. Therefore, you cannot contribute to God's greater purpose if you don't know your personal purpose. But your personal purpose does not separate you from God's greater purpose. Is that clear? So no matter how how much you see what you were born to do, you got to find out where you're supposed to do it. Many of you have come to this vision because this vision needs your vision. This vision needs your purpose. And the purpose God put in this ministry needs your individual purpose to fulfill the corporate purpose of God's dream. That's why everybody here is critical. Tell your neighbor you need me. Look at Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18. Proverbs 29 verse 18. The Bible says without a vision, what happens? The people perish. I don't like that translation because it's too weak. That's the King James. The Hebrew translation says this. Without a revelation of why something exists, the people throw off discipline. That's what the verse says. In other words, without vision, there is no need for discipline. Vision produces discipline. Say it with me. Vision produces discipline. You will never be disciplined in your life until you have a reason to go somewhere. Vision protects you from doing good things so you can do the right thing. There are people who are good people to be with, but they ain't right for you. If you have your vision, you know who to be with. Hello, somebody. You can say no to good opportunities if you know the right place to go. Hello, somebody. There are some jobs that are being offered you, and it's not in keeping with your dream. If you know your dream, you can say no to certain things because you know what things will help you get where you're going. So vision makes you disciplined. Even though you have a good exit and an attraction, attraction there, it keeps you going where you're going because of vision. Tell your neighbor, do you know your address? Keep going. You know, some folks don't know where they're going. That's why any road is taking them there. You can say no when you know what yes is. And vision protects you from doing everything. You know, you are so unique and different and special that God don't want you to be anybody else. And your destination is so perfect for you, he don't want you to end up anywhere else. God wants you to find your vision and your purpose and stay focused on that vision. Romans chapter 1 verse 14, Paul says, I am obligated to preach the gospel. That's been really burning in my heart the last two months. Paul says, I am obligated to fulfill this vision. That means I have nothing else to do. This is what I want to do. I want to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Even though the Jews are good and they are my people and I was born from among them and I am one of them, I was born to preach to the Gentiles. That's why you got to be careful with your vision because your vision protects you from getting distracted by good things. I just discovered something about the devil. The devil is not too concerned about getting you to do bad things. He wants you to do good things that ain't right for you.
especially people like you who want to do good. The devil will distract you in getting involved in other things that are not good for your life. Please look at Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. Nehemiah had a job. Everybody say, have a job. Nehemiah used to work in the king's courts. He was a waiter. Basically, he used to serve the king drinks. And his job was simply a job where he went to work every day to work in the court to help the king. And his job was to serve the drinks. But Nehemiah, even though he had a preoccupation, he was occupied with something else in his heart. He was born with something that won't let him go. And Nehemiah, even though he had a job, was worried by his work. His work disturbed his job. Please write that down. I hope you're getting this. Some of you are on a job and you ain't comfortable because your work is interfering with your job. Your work is what you were born to do. Your job is what you're doing until you get there. And Nehemiah had the same problem. Watch this guy in verse 4. When I heard these things, which things? He heard that the, the wall of Jerusalem was broken down and destroyed and everything was in disarray. It says, when he heard it, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the Lord God of heaven. Can I recommend something to you about number one? And that is, if you're going to get a vision, it's going to have to come from God. When God gives you a vision and confirms it, nothing can stop it. If God tells you to build something, to start something, to invest something, to create something, to manufacture something, whatever God told you to do, it becomes an irritation forever. That's why people who know what they were called to do are usually people who seem to be possessed because they are. They are possessed with this thing that God gave them to do. Nehemiah's first approach for his vision was, let me go to God. And he cried out to God and he moaned and he felt a passion for God. He says, God, something's wrong with our country. Something's wrong with our people. Something's wrong with our neighborhood. Something's wrong with our young people. Something's wrong with the marriages. Something's wrong with our young girls. I mean, he had this burning in him. Some of you got it today. You feel frustrated at things you see. And he went to God and God heard his prayer. Now, what did God do to Nehemiah? God did number two, principle number two. To fulfill your dreams, you got to have passion. Everybody say passion. Come on, say it loud. Passion. You want to be successful, you got to have passion. First you got to have a purpose, then you got to have passion. Passion is a desire that is stronger than death. Passion is a drive that cannot be stopped by opposition. Passion is something that you feel that you can't sleep and you can't stop and you can't eat until you satisfy it. If you can stop what you're doing and still be happy, then you're not passionate. If you can be discouraged by someone telling you no or the bank refusing your money, then you don't have passion. See, passion goes against every problem. Passion defies every resistance. Passion says, even though you say no, I know it means wait. Passion says, even though you don't come now, you'll come later. Passion says, even though you stop me now, I'm going to jump this wall later. Passion says, you could kill me, but I'll rise again and do it again. Passion says, you got to stop me dead before I stop. How many of you feel that way about your dream today? Let me see your hand. That's why this vision is going to come to pass. I mean, they've tried to stop this vision for years, but look what's happening right in front of your eyes. And you ain't seen nothing yet. We're going to build the schools. We're going to build the, the hotel. We're going to build the 5,000 auditorium. We're going to build the student center. We're going to build the youth department. We're going to build it. And guess what? Passion going to push it through. If you want to go to college, don't stop when the first school says no. Fill out another application. If you want to go to college, don't stop because your mom ain't got no money. Your mom don't need to pay your bills. Come on, somebody. Mary's money was in Egypt on a camel with a wise man in the bank. Hey, come on somebody. And when Mary said yes, the camel got up and walked 400,000 miles to get to the woman. Come on somebody. God will bring your provisions to you if he got to cross over the desert to get it to you. God has stuff for you no one knows about. That's what it means when it says the wealth of the wicked is in the wicked's pocket waiting for the righteous to say yes to God's will. But you see, people stop too soon. How bad do you want to start a studio and make it the worldwide thing it's supposed to be? 
Why do you stop at the least resistance? Listen, passion says you might as well give up because I'm not going to quit. Passion says if you knock me down, I'll get back up. Knock me again, get back up. I'll knock and get up until you get tired knocking. That's passion. People don't win because they quit when they fall. Tell your neighbor, get up and get on. Oh, come on, say it like you mean it. Get up and get on. There's no life without passion. Romans chapter 1 verse 15, Paul says, I am eager to do the work God called me to do. First he says, I am obligated. That means I have to do this. This is my will. This is God's will for my life. This is what I will to do. This is my passion. Then he says, I am eager. I have a motivation. I can't wait to do this thing. You know, a man with passion is always eager. He's full of energy. She's always full of a lot of energy. When a woman finds her purpose and she's passionate, I mean, even when trouble comes, she's smiling and saying, this won't last. <laughs> this won't last. Why? I'm tougher than this. Tell your neighbor, tougher than trials. Come on, tell him, I'm tougher than trials. Listen, friends, every resistance have come to make you wiser, not to make you weaker. Every opposition came to strengthen you, not to stop you. So when it comes, welcome it as friends, Paul says. It's come to refine your faith and make you better. Come on, bring the challenges. You know I discovered something? There's no resistance if you ain't moving. People who ain't doing nothing ain't got no problems. Come on, somebody. If you got problems, lift your hand up and just say, thank you, Lord, I'm moving. Come on, say, thank you, Lord, at least I'm moving. If you ain't got no resistance, it's because you're standing still. You got to have passion to be successful in life. Look at Nehemiah. Oh, what a man. The Bible says in chapter 2 of Nehemiah, I love it, verse 2, it says the king, after Nehemiah saw the wall in his vision, and he saw the wall rebuilt. The wall still, still wasn't rebuilt, but he saw a vision of it. He saw the wall built up. And he went back to work, and Nehemiah was depressed. Listen to me, look at me. When you discover God's will for your life, you become depressed. But it's a sanctified depression. It's the good kind. It's the kind that says, I ain't satisfied till I did it. <laughs> look at Nehemiah. Verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Exercises, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. He said, I was doing fine on my job until I saw and heard about the wall. And I had a vision and I went to God and God told me to go back and build it. And even though I was on another man's job, the vision of the wall made me sad, depressed. The king's question, verse Two. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. Let me tell you, you'll never be successful until you are angry at not doing what you know you should do. Let me say it again. You will never be successful until you are angry at not doing what you know you should do. If you are happy about what you are doing, then you're not angry at what you should do. And if you're happy with what you're doing, then you're going to end up settling right there. But a man who has a vision that's beyond where he is at, where he's at makes him sad because where he wants to be will make him happy. You know, I listened to our, one of our doctors here, Dr. Chara here. I met with his wife and I. Uh, we met together the other week for lunch because they were sharing with me in their heart. And I was looking at his eyes while he was talking to me, and I said, poor guy. Here's a medical doctor with a great practice. And many of us have been blessed. Matter of fact, he delivered my two children, praise God. And this man sitting there, crying out his heart, and I can look in his eyes, and his eyes, the guy see something so big, the way he's at is competing with where he wants to go. And here's, here's the same spirit of a person who has a vision. When you have a vision, you are sad about where you are. Because where you want to be is where your joy is. People who are satisfied with where they are will never go where they need to be. 
anger at present conditions will always drive you to new visions. It will take you to new horizons. That's why we must not be satisfied with the Bahamas the way it is. We must not be satisfied with America the way it is. We must not be satisfied with Canada the way it is, or Jamaica, or Trinidad, wherever you're from. If you satisfy, you are part of the problem. People with vision and passion always end up becoming depressed and the depression comes from their passion for change. And Nehemiah was sad and the king noticed it. He says, something's wrong with you. You're not happy anymore. I believe Nehemiah was the kind of man who couldn't hold it in. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers were buried lies in ruin? He says, the reason why I'm sad is because I don't like the way the future looks for my people. Have you got a vision that is so strong it makes you sad? Oh boy, look at verse 4. This is a powerful statement. And the king said to Nehemiah, what is it you want? Ask this question right now, everybody out loud. What is it I want? Think about the question. Do you know what you want out of life yet? I mean, some folks just want a suit. What a horrible dream. Some folks just want the next meal. Come on, man. There's more to life than bread. What do you want? Some folks just want to retire, make it to retirement. What a horrible future to look forward to. Rocking chairs and arthritis. You know, the king asked a good question. What do you want, Nehemiah? God asked the question today. What do you want? Is it on paper? Is it documented? Do you know what you want? Some folks just want a house. Okay, get a house. Now what? I want a car. Okay, you got a car. Now what? I want kids. So you got kids. Now what? I want gray hair. You got gray hair. Now what? I mean, there's got to be something bigger than the things you accumulate. Say amen. Life consists more than the things a man can accumulate. So your vision should not be a house and a car and a lawn and children. There's got to be something bigger than that. And that's why your vision should be in touch with the kingdom of God. That's why building what we have to build here and the thousands coming from around the world can live beyond your house after it burns down. Because people's lives will be changed by what we do in Bahamas Faith Ministries. Come on, feel it with me. My dream is not to build a house and to buy a car. Someone said to me the other day, Pastor Miles, I wish I could buy a Rolls Royce. I said, no, give me the money. I want to use it for something else. I don't need to drive in a fancy car to be satisfied. Come on, somebody. I don't need a $100 pair of shoes and a $1,000 suit to, to feel like somebody. I could preach in, a, in, in Terra Lynn and mow here. Why? There's something more important in life than these things we gather around ourselves. Nehemiah, what do you want? You got to have an answer for the king. And the king is asking the question again today. What do you want? Do you know what you want? I want to go to school. Why? So I get a degree. Why? I prepare myself for the ministry. Why? Because I want to build that place that God told me to build. Why? So that the people can be saved and sanctified and go to heaven. But then go for it. What do you want? I just want to get married. That's no dream. Sometimes that's a nightmare. <laughs> Hallelujah. At least Paul thought so. No, there's got to be a dream bigger than these things that we gather around us. What do you want? What a question. Nehemiah's vision affected his peace because of the passion. Number three, to be successful, you must have a clear plan. Everybody say planning. There will be no future without planning. There'll be no success without a plan. I've known people over and over again who try to be successful without a plan. I mean, some of you in this room don't have a plan for the next 20 years of your life. You don't know what you want to do next week, next month, next year. There's no plan for 1999, no plan for the year 2004. I mean, what do you want to do? Where do you want to be by the year 2020? And you will be alive, I tell you, I guarantee it. Some of you are going to be right around here, floating around. God says, look, will you please make a plan?
Look at Proverbs chapter 9, chapter 16. It's a powerful chapter. Proverbs 16, verse 1 says this. It says, In a man's heart, man makes the plans, but the Lord gives the answer to the tongue. Please underline that verse. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 1. In his heart, man makes the plans, but God gives the answer of the tongue. Look at verse 9, same chapter. It says, In his heart, the man makes the plans, but the Lord directs the steps of the plan. Do you know that God can't direct if you ain't planned? There's nothing for God to direct you in if you have nowhere to go. Now please note, both, both verses says, God leaves the planning up to the heart of the man. But God gives the explanation as to how it will be done. When you put a plan on paper, it's always bigger than your bank book. How many of you know that? Come on, wave at me. That's true? Yes. Why? Because the plan you put in your heart is a documentation of a future that is not finished yet. So when you write a plan down, it's a description of the end of your life. That's why it's not equal to what you got at the beginning. That's why God says, you make the plans, I will explain how it's going to be paid for, who's going to work with it, where the equipment's going to come from, where the facility's going to come from. He said, leave that part to me. You just put the plans down. You know, I'm a sticker for planning. And anyone who work around me will know that. I mean, this vision that we have here is on paper for the next 67 years. I got it all mapped out. That means I'll be about, let's see, 112. Walking around, looking at the buildings. Yeah, look at that. Bless God. All them students over there. I remember we didn't have nothing. Only had one building. Now we got 10 buildings. Glory to God. We got a center on Andrews. Another one on Inago. Glory to God. Another one in Lutra. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's go visit the, 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 the resort down there in Abaco. Let's go. Come on, Brother Richard. Richard can be walking behind me just like this. Let's go. Yeah. Have you have a plan? I plan to do something with next week. And next month and next year. If I ask you right now, can you deliver to me a plan of your life for the next 50 years? And yet God gave you the ability to do that? God gave you a brain with five billion cells and the gift of imagination. He gave you the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the vision of faith. He also given you the articulation of words to put down what you see in your spirit. What are you waiting on? God says he will explain how you can do what you plan. The thing is God can't talk to you because you ain't got nothing to talk about. I mean, right now, praise God, I need about $115 million based on the plan I have on paper. And guess what? It's coming in one million at a time. I can't hear you, somebody. And God told me, don't worry about the next one. Why? Because the resources for that is waiting for that to start. The Bible says he knows where the secret wealth of darkness is hidden. God will bring stuff to you that no one knew they had. Come on, somebody. And some of the folks who hate your guts will pay the bills. God can bring Pharaoh's money into your pocket and take you into the wilderness full, laden down with the gold of the enemy. God did it to Israel. Why not give it to the Bahamians? You've got to understand that God wants you to have a clear plan if you're going to be successful. Look at Nehemiah and his planning. Look at chapter 2. Oh, I like this. Verse 11. I went to Jerusalem after staying there three days. I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. He said, I selected a few people because not everybody can handle the plan. And he went about making a plan to rebuild the wall. By night I went through the valley gate toward the jackal gate. Verse 15, so I went up to the valley by the night ex examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and ran it through the valley gate. Verse 16, the, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the people. I was making plans. Friends, let me tell you something. People can't handle your plans when you're making them. You can't tell your plans to everybody. Hello, somebody. Sometimes you got to write your plans in private and keep them in secret. Some folks don't like you. They'll talk you out of your plans, say you can't do it. In no time, you throw your plans away and be like them. Folks who ain't going nowhere like to take people with them. Y'all better shout this morning because I ain't going to finish till I finish. Some folks who ain't doing nothing want people to do it with them. Nehemiah says, I didn't take too many folks with me. I went by myself and just a few I could trust. And I started making plans to rebuild the wall. I tell you, friends, not everybody understands what you're dreaming, but put your dreams on paper anyhow. 
Your dream is worth writing down. Say amen, somebody. You want to go to college, write your whole 10 years on paper. And this is what I want to be in 10 years. If you want to establish something, put it on paper and say, by the year 2020, this is where I want to be. I tell you what, if you put your plan on paper, you got material for your prayer. You know why your prayer lasts so short? You ain't got nothing to pray about. You put your plan on paper, you will never have enough time for prayer. Because there'll always be something to call on your faith and to believe God for. Put your plan on paper. Nehemiah was a planner. Look at verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them, but the gracious hand of God upon me. And you know, I like the way he put that in there. He says, first of all, let me tell you what a plan to do. A plan to rebuild the wall. Now, friends, here's one man with just a few people, and he's going to do a project that's going to actually take millions of people to, to build. But he says, let's do it. That's a plan. That's a crazy man. Let's rebuild this wall. And he only has a handful of people with him, and it took over a million people to build the wall in the first place. Here's a man starting off at an impossibility and he's saying, let's start. Friends, it ain't what you need that make you successful. It's starting with what you have that make you successful. And what you have is a brain, a good brain that works. And you've got some great ideas. Start right where you are to go where you need to be. He says, let's build. Secondly, he says, the hand of God is upon me. I like that. The guy was so confident saying, God told me to do this. Boy, that's how I feel. I tell you, I hope you feel that way about your dream. God told me to do this. I mean, he wasn't guessing. He says, not only are we going to rebuild it, but God's with your leader. Friends, I can say that without any doubt, with all confidence. God is with me to do what we're born to do. And if you ain't seen it yet, hang around just another more, another day or two. God has given us the city. But we got to know he's with us too. Your dreams are not to be fulfilled by yourself. You need God to fulfill them. Nehemiah says, God's with me. Let's build this wall. Number four, to be successful, you need purpose, passion, a plan, but you also need people. Everybody say people. Say it loud. People, come on, say it again. People, you will never be successful without people in your life. Now, I want to recommend to you a couple of things about people, though. Watch the people who are in your life. Your vision can be destroyed by people or can be encouraged by people. Huh. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17. Please read this with me. Nehemiah says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? Come, let us rebuild. Now, Nehemiah is the one with the dream, but he has to go to us to get it done. Any vision you have, God has some people prepared to work with you. You know, when I went to college, I had a dream just to get my degrees, but there were people who were already been set apart to help me through. And I mean, some of them helped me academically, some helped me financially, some helped me with encouragement and, and spiritual walk. I mean, there were people everywhere to help me. And when you have a dream, that's the way it works. People will always be there waiting for your dream. But if you have no dream, the people who are supposed to help you can't find you. Nehemiah says, let us build and let us do it together. There will always be a need for people. Look at uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Everybody say negative people. Everybody say positive people. There's some people who are good for you and some that are bad for you. And you got to know the difference very quickly. There are people who I call toxic people. They contaminate your vision. They pollute your mind and try to destroy your faith. Stay away from toxic people. There are polluted people who try to come into your life and destroy your dream. They always talk negative. What you can't do, what's never been done, what has never been done, what cannot be done here. No one has never done it for the first time. You better stop that, get back to what you were doing. Why don't you be what other people are? I mean, people will talk you out of your dream if you're not careful. Can I suggest that there are there are a number of types of people. I call them external and internal opposition. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1 says, When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became what? Angry. The minute you decide to fulfill your dream, all your enemies wake up. And as long as you ain't doing nothing, ain't nobody going to bother you. Hello. 
I mean, here you are on a job, you're a nice secretary, you've been there for 20 years, everyone thinks you're happy, and one day you decide, I'm going back to school. Why? I'm going to take a master's degree in computer. Why? Because I want to begin a computer company. Well, friends, all your friends will become enemies that day. First question, who do you think you are? Second question, do you know how old you are? Third question, you realize your brain ain't working no more? Fourth question, who do you think will come to your school? I mean, by the time they finish, you settle down and be a secretary again. People get angry when you step out and start to do something that they haven't done before. So listen, one of the principles is that people will come against you. Get used to the idea. There will be people who will talk and gossip and malign and slander. That's a part of the process. Why? It's proof that you're doing something. The minute you start to step out and start to fulfill your dream, here comes the angry ones. And believe me, the angry ones will attack you. I look at this passage here, verse 2, and in the, pre in, in the presence of his associates and in the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring st stones back to life from these heaps of rubble? Look at the questions they're asking. People who are angry ask questions to discourage you. Oh, Lord, help us. Verse 3, Tobiah, the Amorite who was at his side said, what are they building? Even if a fox climb upon it, it'll fall down. When, when you start your own business, everyone attacks you from the outside. Your mother says, you better stay on your job, it's secure. Your cousin says, what you leaving your job for, girl? That's sure money. Your brother says, now listen, girl, don't you go behind that fool of teaching about that Bible thing. You better stay on your job. And they attack you. And by the time they finish, you end up being a secretary all your life with a burden on the inside, frustrated forever. Dying young because of high pressure and high blood pressure. People will attack you when you start to do what you were born to do. It comes with the job. You see, when you become an original, the copies don't like you. And that's the problem. People want you to be what they want you to be, not what you were born to be. And when you start to step out of what they expect you to be, they begin to hate you and see you as a problem. Tell your neighbor, you might as well get used to me. Because you're going to see me anyhow. Tell your neighbor, when I die, you'll never forget me. People who change the world decide to declare independence from other people's opinions. That's what makes the difference in life. There will be opposition. You know, it's amazing. I might as well tell you this little secret. But do you know that every year, personally, I earn and give to this ministry over four to $500,000? Personally, I give it to this ministry. All the books that are sold in this ministry, all my money, I give to the ministry. All. All the tapes and videos that are sold around the world. I mean hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. I give it. Not one cent comes to me from those tapes and books. Give it over oh, $500,000 given to the ministry last year from me personally. If I want to be rich, I could be rich. But wealth don't mean nothing to me. I love the vision of God. So please, why not about money? Play it again. All you money oh. our money stand that oh. this is our money oh. so you can't go behind people hello somebody people will lie on you make up stories about you rumors all around the city but keep your eyes on the wall keep on working keep on building keep on trucking why they're gonna join you later They just don't know. Look at Nehemiah chapter 11. There's another group of people you got to watch carefully. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them. And we will kill them and put an end to this work. Wow. Let's read it again. Chapter 4, verse 11. 
Not only do you have external opposition, but he says, the enemies said, let us be right among them. And we will kill them and stop this great work they are doing. There are people who come within. I hope you ain't one of them. And they come just to raise questions. Spread little questions. Here it is, San Ballot knows that you need to get inside to people who just come within your vision and they just spread rumors. Start asking questions and, and questioning things and putting ideas in people's head. That's a part of, of, of the vision. That's how it works. If you're going to be successful, get ready for internal opposition. People have meetings on you at their homes and quiet meetings in restaurants and discussions behind the wall. Hey, listen, ignore them and keep building. I know y'all ain't gonna clap now because you might be one of them, but listen here. <laughs> the Bible says not only are they come from the outside, but they join you. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Come on, young people, help me out here. <laughs> I mean, people are just, isn't that subtle? We'll attack the outside. Also, we love some plants. We plant some people on the inside. Boy, I tell you, all during these years, 15 years, folks have been planted in this ministry. I know about some of them. They think I don't know about them. They were planted here to check me out, see if I was political. To see if I was interested in toppling a government or if I was interested in trying to run for politics or something. I mean, they were planted to check me out. Plants. And they sing hallelujah right next to you. You didn't even know who they were. Hallelujah. <laughs> planted people. Then there are those whose hearts are not in the vision. But they're excited about the new building. And they come excited to sit down for a while. All of a sudden they start saying, saying things. Here, yeah. what are they doing with that money? They ask for money again? I mean, just negative little questions. And it begins to create a cancer. From among them, we can kill them and stop the work. Boy, if you're going to be successful in your vision, get ready for internal opposition. And sometimes you get to ask people to leave once in a while. And sometimes you get to fire people too. Many, sometimes it just ain't working. You know, you got to, I mean, internal opposition is such a cancerous thing. See, those who outside, you know who they are. It's them inside ones that really, David says, if it was my enemies, I could handle it. He said, but my own friends. Cut my throat, he says. Get ready for it. Man, you start a business, you're going to hire folks who got an aim to destroy your business. And they came to be an employee so they could deflate you. Keep your vision. Watch the people that are around you. And finally, I saw something here that made me shudder in my boot. There is spiritual opposition. Watch this. Look at Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 10. One day, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Metabal. All oh, the them kind of names. I should have questioned who he was anyhow. <laughs> and he said, listen to this. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you as the leader they're coming by night and coming to kill you now this man was a prophet so he's prophesying to nehemiah he said let's go to the house of god let's go to the presence of the lord let's go to the inner sanctuaries of god and let's protect ourselves from those who want to kill you nehemiah watch him but I said, should a man like me run away? Or should one like me go into the temple to save my own life? I will not go. I realized that God has not sent this man to me, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him to prophesy. He had a prophecy. The prophecy was secure yourself. Protect yourself. Forget about the people. Forget about the ministry. Protect yourself. Grab the money and run now. 
Things tough. Things under pressure now. People talking about you now. Quit now while you're ahead. Take the money and run. Nehemiah's attitude, an awesome leader. He says, I'll die with the people. You can take that from me too, friends. I'm going to die with this vision. He says, who am I to save my own life? If everybody is running for sake it, he says, I'm going to stay with it. I'm going to see it through to the end if I do it by myself. Man, you ain't going to be successful if you ain't planning to go by yourself, brother. I love Jesus, man. You couldn't stop a man like Jesus. Seventy members of his church, he says, that those who are not going to go with me and eat my flesh, drink my blood, and go through the pressure and go through the tribulations and all the malignment and all the criticism, he kind of says, leave. The Bible says they left him. And he turned to the twelve and he says, you want to go too? Tell me now so I go by myself. And Peter says, we really want to go, but we find out that's where we're supposed to be. And some of y'all are only here because of that. <laughs> All the bad talk you get when you go to work, you're only here because God wants you here. Stay right where you are. Where God wants you, stay the Paul says, I mean, Peter says rather, we are here because we found what we were looking for. Can I suggest to you, friends, that there are even spiritual opposition. People come and say, you know, the Lord spoke to me and told me to tell you to leave BFM. You ever heard that one? That's a prophecy from the devil. If God sent you, how could he send someone else to tell you to leave? God's confused. Tobiah paid that person to come talk to you. Said, Brother, I hear they taking all your money. See, they're building that building. Miles getting all the praise. His name on the radio. His name on TV. You better leave there. That's Tobias paying off somebody to prophesy to you. I mean, if you look at every vision, you'll notice that there's no name of one million people in this book. But there's Nehemiah on the name on the book. Somebody got to lead the vision. But guess, who called, but guess who called all the trouble and all the opposition? There's a price to have your name in the book. Come on, say amen, somebody. There's a price to be the one who they talk about, whether it's good or bad. And when they talk about you, they ain't going to talk about you. They can talk about me. Everybody say, go, Pastor, go. Come on, say it like you believe it, man. Come on, encourage me this morning. Yeah, let me go. We're going to build this ministry. We're going to see it come to pass. We're going to do it. When we die, the children are going to come and say, look what mommy did. Look what daddy did. We did it. And if they could do it, we could do it too. That's what they're going to say. We're not doing this for ourselves. We're doing this for the unborn children. What a word. Nehemiah says, I will not save my own skin because this work is for everybody. And God called me to die for this work. Number five, you're going to be successful. You need to understand purpose, passion, plan, people, and potential. Everybody say potential. Say it loud. God will never give you an assignment without the ability. He will never call you to an assignment without giving you the provisions. God is a God who gives you the potential to perform your dream. So you are able to carry out what you were born to do. And if you understand that, no one can stop you. That's why no matter what you have or don't have, you are able to do what you were born to do. Everything God gave you to do, you are able to do. Everything God put in your heart, the ability is present to do it. That is why God will never give you a dream to frustrate you. He gives you dreams to deliver you and to reveal you to the world. Dreams are given to you to pull out of you what's already inside of you. That's why God gives you dreams bigger than your education. What I'm doing, I am not trained to do by education. What I'm doing, I am not able to do based on society's standards and measurement of my IQ. And what you're going to do and what you are doing, they don't believe you're doing it either. But who cares what they think? Just keep on doing what God tells you to do. The ability comes out when you obey God and say yes to your dream. Potential is necessary to fulfill God's will and he gives it and he gives it all the time. Look at Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 6 very quickly. It says here, oh I love this, you're going to love this. It says, so we rebuilt the wall until all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all of their ability. Whatever God call us to do in this ministry is right in this room. The people, the intelligence, the experience, it's in this room. And you are one of those people who got the ability to do the work. 
That's why God called you here. Whether you are 96 or 6, you are filled with the ability to do this work that God has called us to do. And that's why the ability is always present with responsibility. All right, number six. To be successful, you must understand the power of provision. Everybody say provision. Say it again, provision. God will never give you a vision without provision. Whatever you were born to do, the ability and the provision is available for it. Now, provisions are strange. It's usually hidden until you arrive. Whatever you were born to do attracts what you need to do it. So you've got to establish what you want to do first before what you need comes. Most of us work the reverse. We like to see the provisions first, then start. That's not the way faith works. Faith works by you starting first, and the provisions come to what you start. That's why every act of God begins with an act of man. You begin acting first and God brings the provision. I remember Job Moses talking to God one day and God was telling Moses, you're going to do this great work. And Moses told God something that got God angry. Moses, God, I cannot speak. I am not good in speech. Even from the day that I was a child, I could not speak. Look at me. This is very interesting. God's answer was, who makes them dumb? Who makes them mute? Who makes them blind? Who makes them dumb? Is it not I, said the Lord? Now friends, I don't know about the healing and all that stuff. But here God is telling us in the fourth chapter of uh, Exodus that he personally, in most cases, where there is a need, for a vision to be fulfilled, he makes certain people dumb, blind, and mute. What could God be getting at? He's telling Moses, you were created to deliver these people from Egypt. That's your purpose. You were born for it. But I made sure you couldn't talk properly. Now, wait a minute, God. You're not going to heal me? No. Nope. But you are Jehovah Rapha. I told you that yesterday. I'm Jehovah Rapha. But you're not going to heal my tongue. No. Why? Verse 10. For even now, your brother Aaron is on the way. And he will be your mouthpiece. You know why God don't give you everything you need? Because he got other folks who are supposed to do it for you. God has provisions all over the world waiting for you. You know, I was thinking the other day, Sister Beverly Dwyer, who is here working with us, a tremendous talented woman, she was born in England. And I was thinking about her, and we were talking the other day. I said, you know, isn't it amazing? Here you were born in England, minding your own business. And all this time, the Lord knew that you were born to be here. And God will move you thousands of miles to get where you were born to be, to do things that you were born to do, to fulfill the, the, the purpose in your own heart, and also in the meantime, to fulfill the purpose in his heart. There are people who went to school to study accountancy just to work for you. And right now, they're on the wrong job because you ain't started your business yet. <laughs> there are people who were born to fulfill your vision with you. Provisions are always provided, including your staff and your money and your buildings and all the resources you need are already there. God is a God of provision. He is Jehovah Jireh. He provides everything, but he provides it after you begin the work of the vision. I think about all the people in this room today. This room is filled up. And I say, Lord, just suppose I had said no to God. How many millions of people may not have ever known the Lord who we serve? Your obedience affects other people's lives. And that is why obedience is not a private issue. It's a public issue. It affects everyone who's supposed to work with you and be affected by your life. Number seven, to be successful, you need persistence. Everybody say persistence. Say it loud, persistence. You know, Nehemiah could have stopped from all the gossip, all the jeers, all the problems, but he was persistent. You will never be successful unless you have the spirit of persistence. Persistence means you insist on having what you're going after. Persistence means that you stand up against resistance until you wear it out. 
Persistence means that you irritate opposition until they leave. Persistence means you make people who are against you so tired they become your friends. Persistence means that the only way you give up is after you've finished. How bad do you want it? A persistent person is an irritating person. They keep coming back. Jesus told a story in Luke chapter 18 about a persistent woman. Hello, somebody. She kept on irritating the judge, irritating the judge. The judge said, give it to her. And that's what God wants you to do. God wants you to come to life and say, life, this belongs to me. And life says, no, on Monday, you come back on Tuesday, say, it belongs to me. And life says, no, on Tuesday, you come back on Wednesday, and say, it belongs to me. And life says, no, on Thursday, you come back on Friday morning. And life says, no, on Sunday, you come back on Sunday. But life says, no, on Sunday, you come back the next Monday and the next Tuesday. And after two months, life says, here. Yeah. And you say, thank you very much. A lot of people lose because they quit when life says no. Persistent people are irritating people. They just won't go away. And number eight. Oh, this is a critical one. Patience. If you're going to be successful with your vision, you got to have what? Patience. You know, people who have long patience will always win. The Bible says a patient man is stronger than an army. When I read that, I couldn't believe that until I understood the power of patience. You know, a patient person can make you angry. Why? Because you want them to get mad. You want them to react to you. But they don't. They just kind of just wait. Now, nothing can make you more nervous than a waiting person. <laughs> I mean, you try everything and all they do is just wait. Patience has power. Say it with me. Patience has power. It may take a while for your vision to come to pass, but if you are willing to tarry, as the writer says, it will come to pass. Not because you don't see it when you had it down in your notes, it means it ain't coming. The reason why you make plans is so you can have plans to change. Hello. You make plans so you can rearrange your plans. And that is why God gave you the power of planning so you can rearrange your schedule of things. You should always put deadlines on things but be willing to rearrange the deadline because you know it's coming anyhow. You know, it took God 6,000 years to send Jesus. That's a long time to wait. But he came anyhow. Can I hear say amen? The Bible says in the fullness of time God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law and to deliver those who are under the law and the curse of the law. He came in the fullness of time. Be patient with your dream. Don't stop it, just be patient. Don't quit, just be patient. And when someone asks you about it, tell them, I'm just waiting for the next move. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It will not tarry, it's coming. I gotta wait for it. Friends, what we are talking about, we used to talk about what we sitting in, we used to talk about this 10 years ago. Hello, somebody. Now we sitting in and talking about the next one. Glory to God. Patience. And people wondered whether it would ever happen. I never wondered once. And I ain't wondering but the next five buildings. I ain't wondering once. Why? It all come to pass in your lifetime if you are willing to go with the vision patiently. Patience is the key to power. You know, if you threaten a man and he just waits, your threat gonna wear off. Patience. Number nine. Perseverance is the key to being successful. Perseverance. Everybody say perseverance. Perseverance actually means to bear up under pressure. You know, people who are successful are like tea bags. When the going get hot, they make tea. <laughs> Hello, somebody. When life squeezes you, be like a lemon. Make lemonade. I mean, don't sit there getting mad. Do something with the pressure. Persevere under it. Use it for your own benefit. Can I hear an amen? Listen, if you're going to be successful, get ready for pressure and trouble. People who have vision are stronger than the pressure life brings. That's why they use it to make tea instead of crying out. When I get hot water, I just make tea. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, I discovered that you don't get the scent from the rose until you crush it. Sometimes God wants to smell something, so he just puts you on a little vice. 
and put the pressure on you so you can still smell his glory coming out of you. And out of ashes, he brings the joy and the oil and the wonderful things that he has put inside of you. And sometimes we don't understand the character alone is formed by pressure. And when pressure comes, it comes to get rid of what's not of God and to leave what's pure gold. Can I hear an amen? How many of you in the fire right now? Let me see your hands. Boy, I tell you, it's good being in the fire. Tell your neighbor, go ahead and make tea. Contaminate your enemies with the scent of God. Let them pressure you to release the glory of God. And don't run, stay in it. Stay in the fight, young people. Because there is no stopping a man who understands that pressure is good for him. Pressure is one of the keys to perseverance, developing character. And number 10, prayer. Everybody say prayer. There's no success without prayer. You will never fulfill your vision without prayer. Why? Because prayer is what keeps you in touch with the one who gave you the vision. The Bible says in chapter John 15, verse 1, it says, I am divine, you the branch, but open me, you can't do nothing. You stay in touch with God. You'll always have reserve and you always have refreshing. You know, when you finish being pressed and being uh, criticized and having opposition, you get tired. And there are many nights and days even when I stumble into the prayer room and say, God, if you don't help me, take me home. Sometimes it gets tough in your business. It gets tough trying to start that new company. It gets difficult trying to pursue a new aspect of your vision or to do something that no one has ever done. It gets rough trying to, 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 go, into, to go to school or something. And you feel, Lord, am I ever going to make it? That's a good time to run to God. God to me is like the, it's like the, the, uh, the coach in the corner of a boxer. You know, when he finished getting beat up after a couple of rounds, he staggers back into the corner of life. And before he gets there, there's a stool which says, sit down. Thank God for the stool. And all of a sudden, while his eyes are swollen, his eyes are bleeding, and his face and everything all stinging, all his body all messed up, all of a sudden they feel this cool water coming down from a sponge. The water of the world just refreshes him. And then they take some grease and oil and put on his eyes and anoints him all over again. And while he's doing that, there feels a thumb against his back, rubbing his muscles, saying, that's all right, you almost had him that time, you get him next time. Come on, somebody, say amen. That's what prayer is. Prayer is going back in the closet and say, God, I ain't going back out there. And by the time you sit down, you say, where is the devil? Come on, let's go again. God pushes you back out there. That's what prayer is. The Bible says he will renew your strength. How? Like an eagle. And you shall mount up with wings of eagle. You shall run and not be weary. You shall walk and not faint. Yes, you get tired. And sometimes you want to quit. But I tell you, if you are willing to bear up in prayer and stand before God and say, God, I need you, God will bring refreshing. And believe me, friends, every champion did not win every round. Hallelujah. And you know, when you finish your vision and they see you walking around and they're so proud of what you did, they're taking pictures of you under buildings. Oh, and then, you know, you got your belt on. You're the champion. But you see, you don't tell them about them rounds you lost, how you staggered in sometime. You see, a real fighter doesn't wear his medals on his chest. He wears them on his back. He shows you the scars. He says, see all the beating I've been through? That's what it took to get what I have. If you ain't willing to take the scars, you'll never wear the crown. Prayer is where you receive refreshing to start again. That's why you got to learn to always find those time every day to get in with God and say, God, I'm scared. He wants you to say that. Why? Then he can say to you, I'm with you. That's enough. Let us go back, Lord, and fight one more day. You can win. You can be victorious if you are willing to take what you are afraid of to God in prayer. Let's read one more scripture before we close. And I'd like for you to read this uh, chapter 6, verse, four, verse 11, starting from there. Verse 14, rather. Prayer. When all the trouble came to Nehemiah. Look at Tobiah Sanballat. Tobiah says, remember, oh my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the, prof the prophetess, Nodiah, and the rest of the prophets who have been trying to intimidate me. He took them where? To prayer. He didn't answer the newspapers. He went to prayer. He didn't try to explain what he was doing to them. He went where? To prayer. When people attack your dream, go to God. Don't try to explain and give an answer to everything because you can't explain to a critic nothing because their motive is already contaminated and they'll use your words against you. Go to God in prayer. 
That's why in this ministry we have such commitment to prayer meetings and to intercession and why we strive on prayer. Because without prayer, we cannot get where we are nor where we plan to go. And there can be times over and over again when all we got is prayer. We ain't got nothing, no money, no people, no resources, just prayer. And God will give us the victory.